Well, good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this Women in Football webinar. This is our second online webinar, and we're really grateful to you for attending today, for all your support, not just today, but over recent months, we've had lovely messages from our members, and it, um, it's been great to connect with you all. Now, before we go any further, Today is an important and very sad anniversary because it's 35 years today since the Bradford Stadium fire in which 56 people died. All of us involved in football will uh, at least have knowledge of the tragedy and some of us, myself included, uh, remember it. Uh, it was an absolutely tragic event uh, that people who were going to just follow their team and watch a football match should uh, suffer that dreadful disaster. So we think of everybody who uh, was and remains affected by the Bradford fire today. So moving on, uh, I'm delighted to welcome our two guests to this webinar, uh, Dr. Sean Massey-Ellis and Ruth Shaw. And a little bit of an introduction on each of them. Ruth is the general manager of the Premier League Charitable Fund and she's a former Women in Football board member. Now, prior to her role with the Premier League Charitable Fund, Ruth held roles in the UK government and worked as chief executive of the Sports Ground Safety Authority and the Football Licensing Authority. She's also been named as one of the 50 leading lights in the Lloyds Bank Kindness and Leadership Awards. I'm lucky enough to call her a friend and I would say that she is absolutely a leader and she's also one of the kindest people I know. Welcome Ruth. Thank you. Sean needs no introduction. As the first English woman to officiate at a men's European fixture and a familiar face from TV as a Premier League assistant referee and she has a wealth of experience at the highest levels of the game and in every aspect of refereeing. I'm not just saying this because she's here, but I'm delighted to have the opportunity to repeat something I've privately thought for a long time. Best lino in the Premier League, Sean. Sina makes some absolutely fantastic calls. Uh, Sean worked as a fourth official at the Women's FA Cup final in 2009. I believe that was her first kind of high level game, but no doubt she'll talk more about that. And she's worked, she worked at an assist, as an assistant referee at last summer's Women's World Cup in France. So Sean's going to be sharing stories of her career, explaining how she first started working in football and giving tips, advice and support to those just starting out on their career journey. Welcome Sean and I'll now hand over to Ruth and Sean. Thank you. Thanks Jane, it's uh, brilliant to be back amongst uh, women football friends and family. Uh, I can feel the love and support already uh, and I would just say um, use the chat function to connect with each other if you like. There's a little box you can tick on that says message to all panellists attendees and if you click on that then everyone will see. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself, let other people know you're on the call, say who you are, what you do or where you're from. Um, and then we can have a bit of a connection in the conversation as well as hearing from Sean, which is uh, very exciting. I'm looking forward to. So um, a few ground rules. I'm sure I don't need to say it because Women in Football is such a positive and supportive network. Uh, but do, if you're putting anything on the chat, let's keep it positive. Let's keep it polite. Um, this is something, a great opportunity for us all to learn from Sean and hear from her. So if you've got questions you want to pose, um, observations, reflections, pop them in that chat and we'll try and pick those up. Um, I'm going to take the next 30 minutes or so to ask some questions of Sean that we've been thinking about and dying to ask in advance. Uh, but we'll also open up to you if you've got some burning questions you want to put to Sean. So um, I'm going to start, I suppose, with a bit of context, which is it's nearly two months now since professional football was suspended uh, on 13th of March, Friday the 13th. And it's seven weeks to the day since the Prime Minister announced some of the restrictions um, on movements and, and they were imposed. And Sean, I wonder if you might say about how that unfolded for you and what your experience has been like in those seven weeks. Yes, yeah, so I've been in a little bit longer than that because uh, my last game I was on was at Arsenal with Arteta. So 
actually I was in a couple of weeks before the official lockdown because of being in contact with Arteta so I got a phone call um, the same day it kind of came out in the press a little bit earlier in the morning just to say that he tested positive and that um, basically I needed to self-isolate because we shook hands at the end of the game you know like normal people um, so obviously I'd been in that environment so that kept kept me in a little bit longer but um, yeah Brilliant. And, and how's life changed for you? Kind of, are there any challenges or silver linings to what you're experiencing at the moment? Yeah, it's um, positives and negatives, I think. I, I used to really moan about the fact that I never got to really spend any time at home, um, that I you know, wasn't with my daughter a lot, even at the weekends when she was off school. You know, so that, for me, is a real positive. That I'm actually getting to spend a little bit more time with her, um, you know, do schoolwork, homework together, things, you know, as a normal mum does, to be a bit more of a present mum, actually. So that's definitely um, a bit of a bonus. Uh, negative sides are actually kind of same, similar thought process, really, that trying to be a teacher at home uh, is really difficult. Um, she's only four and a half, so she kind of needs me sat alongside her the entire time. So, yeah, that's been quite difficult as well. I'm sure there's a few people on the call who will uh, understand the challenges of homeschooling while also trying to work. Um, and has work changed for you? What's the training regime like now? Or what's your interaction with the, the bodies of support that you're working with? Yeah, so um, it's, it kind of reduced quite a bit because obviously they looked at the programme of it's likely that we weren't going to be back very soon. So they actually reduced our training load for two to three weeks. Um, and they've just started ramping it up again now. So um, we weren't, we kind of were, were still biking a bit, you know, but not a lot of heavy weights or um, not a lot of, a lot of running, still allowed to run, things like that. And then they just started back. So we were back last week in full training. That's three sessions a day, um, ramping it, ramping it up. I've got an 8K to do today. Um, uh, a lot of strengthening work as well to kind of get us ready for, for the season because they're, they're looking at it that if and hopefully the season will resume soon obviously when it's safe to do so um that we might have to go from the end of this season effectively straight into the start of next so they've kind of said to us that we needed to reduce our training to then kind of ramp it up and to be able to go effectively a season and a half without a break it sounds like you, you're certainly busy, a bit, probably busier than ever, but um, we come a bit more to what you're missing uh, as well as what you're doing. But I wonder if we take you back in time a little to how you first got involved uh, in refereeing at all. So take us back, tell us how your journey started. So I was 13-ish uh, and um, my dad's a referee, so that's kind of context you probably need to know. Um, and he also run a Sunday league team. So... I wanted a paper round because I wanted money to go out with my friends, basically, whether that be the cinema or, you know, to buy sweets at the shop. Um, and so I said to my dad, come on, I need a paper round or something. I need some pocket money. I need, because they never gave me pocket money. I was I always kind of asked for things and got what I want, not got everything within limits. Um, I'm not from a well-off family, so it was in, within reason. Um, so I wanted a paper round. And my dad said to me, you won't do it, Sean. You'll never get up in the morning. He will end up doing it. And he was probably right. I never would have got up in the mornings. Mornings are not my strong suit. Um, and uh, he said, why don't you referee? And I was like, what? Didn't really know anything about refereeing. Um, and um, I, the only kind of background football that I had was when he used to go to football on a Sunday to his local club, I used to try and get in the car with him. He hated me coming because it meant he couldn't go to the pub afterwards. Um, but I kind of jumped in the car and was always on the sidelines. It was me and this one other girl that used to kick a ball on the sidelines. There wasn't really any teams for me to play. That was kind of my only knowledge of football, really. The lads used to play on the pitch and I used to kick a ball up and down the sideline. Um, and annoy my dad really um, and he said well, why don't you come a referee so I thought well why not and I kind of did say to him at the time well am I allowed to do that because I genuinely didn't know of any other girls that were referees to be honest I thought it was a bit of an old man thing like, because my dad did it that it was kind of that generation of people that did it um, so I took the course at 13 technically wasn't allowed to be on the course till I was 14 um, well, I was 14 when I passed the course and it was a traditional um, 10 weeks in a working men's club, listening to the laws of the game. 
and kind of having tests on it. And that was about it. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I studied a bit, but still didn't really understand it. Um, and, uh, you know, the kind of referees that are there to support you and get you through the course. They used to come and kind of do little one-to-one -one sessions with me so that I could get through the course. Um, I really didn't understand it. And definitely, it's different now because it's a practical course, whereas back then it was just purely theory. Um, and yeah, so passed the course and then went on to referee, started with under 12s football in my local youth league. Brilliant. And um, you said you didn't really know what you're doing at first. So kind of was that a steep learning curve when you got onto the pitch? Tell us a little bit about kind of how it felt when you actually had to referee as well as just learn the laws and, and study. Yeah, that was a big shot, to be honest. I thought I knew. I thought I knew the laws and that that would be all I needed. But actually it wasn't. So I got onto the pitch and I was very lucky that I had my dad qualified referee and another ex-Premier League linesman on the other line. And um, they basically flagged and I blew the whistle. So I actually didn't have a clue what I was doing. I didn't know what was what. So I knew the law in my head, but actually being able to physically blow a whistle and know what I was blowing the whistle for was a steep learning curve. So I kind of like, they flagged, I blew the whistle. And I was like, oh, so they flag every time they do that. I get it now. So I kind of learned very quickly like that. And I think that... Um, I started to get that actually it wasn't really the laws that I needed to know. I just needed to make the game fair. And I think that's kind of what my approach to it was. And I think that, you know, I was 14, 15, coming through that learning period of, you know, playing under 12s football, playing 25 minutes each way on a Sunday morning. Um, that I kind of learned to, I wasn't just there to be a lawmaker, if that makes sense. I was there to kind of teach the others the laws and to keep them fair. So I think, you know, things like foul throws, an under 12 does a foul throw, they don't really understand that they have to keep their feet on the floor. But I think I kind of like, felt like I was more of a teacher. So that I was there to go over them and say, oh, you need to do it like this. And, you know, the amount of times that I actually showed somebody how to take a proper throw in during a game of football. And I think that's kind of where I learned my trade. I learned my skills. So things like confidence, like, you know, I was 13, 14 year old girl stood in the middle with all these parents around the outside. And I really learned to be quite confident. I had to trust my own decisions. I had to believe in myself. And that really actually was a life skill that I learned through refereeing. Um, and I think half time at them matches is a very lonely place, you know, because all the play players, the children, they go off to their parents or their coaches on the sideline. And you kind of stand there like, how long have we had now? <laughs> you know, can we start playing again? Um, so I think I learned a lot about, you know, being lonely and that being okay. So I think I learned a lot in them young years, not just about how to be a referee, if that makes sense. Yeah, how to be a lot of other things, taught me a lot of skills. There's a great quote uh, that half time can be a lonely place. Can you say a bit more about whether you feel that still? Is that still the case when you're, you're kind of working to this day? Do you still feel that? Um, not so much because we work in teams. So when we leave a pitch now, there's kind of the four of you that leave the pitch and go to the changing room together and you kind of talk, you know, straight away, we're like, oh, what did you think about that? Oh yeah, yeah, you know, play reaction probably said we got it wrong, but it, you know, I, I said it and you said it, because obviously we're in communication the entire time. So even we'll talk about silly things like throw-ins, like, oh, they all complained about that. So we probably got it wrong, but you know, well, I said blue and you said blue. So it's likely that it was a blue throw, you know? So I think we, that's a little bit less of a lonely place now because we kind of have that, debate and discussion you're always kind of analyzing the decisions continuously i think even you know half time full time in particular with your colleagues and friends they have to be friends because you know it can be quite a lonely place like you say on a football field and you can sometimes feel like every decision you're given is the wrong one um but i think then people can kind of you know that team environment of the four of you can create quite a nice environment you know support you know especially with var now and you make a decision and you know you've got it wrong. So you have to kind of have that team, people around you to go, you know, you know, like, come on, Sean, it's one mistake in however many games we've done together. And you kind of kick yourself for it. Of course, you, do, you don't want to get things wrong. But um, you definitely need that team environment. I think at half time can be very supportive. 
I think that's a really key um, point for the network as well about support and where you find that support. Um, could you say a bit maybe about some of the champions or the allies that you've had along your journey? How important has having people support and champion you been to your professional development? Really, really important. And like people always say to me, oh, you know, if you've got a role model that you look up to or that you wrangle, but I don't think I really had that one person. I had lots of people that supported me. And I think, you know, from... I remember, and it's a really vivid memory that I can really remember it from being so young, that um, one of my um, youth league operators, chairman, kind of secretary, who appoints the referees to the games, um, one of them guys who does everything, you know, he's a groundsman, is the, you know, everything, gave his life to football, and he was a real big supporter of referees. And I remember him kind of ringing me and saying, oh, I'm going to give you this, this local derby game, you know, it was under 14s, under 15s game. I can't remember the actual game, but he um, he said, "I'm gonna." Eat. Last time that they played, the game got abandoned. It was um, you know the, the players and players were kind of fighting, and the parents were all arguing on the sidelines. And I was like, "Oh, I'm not sure that I can do that." And he was like, "No, Sean, you're good enough. You can referee this game. This is why I want you on it." And I think that people like that have kind of had more belief in me than I have in myself. And I think it took a lot of people like that through my career. So, you know, I did that game and it went well. And actually his support through that, that sticky time in my career. And I think I can go along my path and always see things like that. You know, so like Howard Webb was, a, you know, a big friend of mine. And he was one of them when I first got onto the Premier League that he was like, yeah, well, I'll take you with me, you know, and it could have been a really difficult place to be in that group of quite a small group of men um you know if they'd have actually said i'm not taking her on my line that might have been a completely different place but i was very lucky in places like with howard you know he was like oh sean do you fancy coming to china to referee man city um arsenal in a friendly and i was like yeah of course you know but he trusted me he wanted me on, on his line so i think that i've had lots of people through the years, you know, from that under 15s game right up to when I first got on the Premier League, to I think champions that always supported me and, you know, believed in me when I not necessarily believed in myself. <laughs> Excellent. And there's a few, I think a few questions coming through on the chat about that being in that male dominated environment. So it's great to hear some positives around male allies and champions that have taken you along with, with you, thanks to your talents and uh, ability, of course. But I, I wonder, um, might you say a little bit about what it's like being a woman in a very male dominated environment? Your questions here around whether that's ever been particularly challenging for you? Have you faced, you know, difficult circumstances as a result of that? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I kind of don't see it like that. I think, I don't know whether that's because I'm quite a laid back, resilient person. Um, I mean, don't be wrong, there's, there's always been challenges. I remember going to a, a ground and um, going to walk into like the changing area tunnel and there was a big placard that said, no ladies past this point or no women past that point, I can't remember. And I remember thinking, well, like, where am I going to get changed then? Oh, I just went through the door and that's just me. I kind of thought, well, I still must be able to get changed down here. Um, and I think little challenges like that, that I've always faced. I mean, like opinions don't really phase me. Um, you know, if somebody comes up to me and they've got a valid opinion on my performance, i.e., oh, Sean, in, in the 31st minute, that was an awful decision. You know, like, it's a clear corner or, you know, did you not see the deflection on the ball? Or I can definitely go, well, actually, I'm going to look at that back, you know, and, and analyse my performance. But people saying, oh, you're a woman, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, I've had that, yeah. You know, I can't say that I haven't. Um, but I think that I always kind of kind of thought, oh, you know what, you just don't know what you're talking about. I'll just carry on doing what I do because, you know, like I'm quite a, you know, I, I think being an assistant, being offside is quite black and white and I'm quite a black and white person. So I think unless somebody shows me a video where I was wrong, I won't write because I think that's probably a skill that I've had to develop as a referee, I think you have to be quite confident and you have to believe in yourself because nobody else is going to trust your decisions. You know, when you're on a football pitch and you think, right, that's a throw in, it's that way, I've got to trust that decision. Until somebody tells me afterwards, you know, watch that video, you're wrong. I've got to trust in them decisions. I think that's the only way you become a referee. Um, most challenging is probably at youth football. That is a really difficult place to be. Um, and I think it, it really, 
that stood me in good stead for my career as a referee, I think, because I think that's where you, you kind of learn to be very resilient. You learn to be quite strong and quite confident. And it taught me all of those skills. It taught me how to communicate. It taught me, you know, when the, you're at youth football and, you know, you've got two male coaches come up to you saying what lines you want us to run. And I have to say, I want you to run left backs. And I know that involves them changing sides and having to be next to the opponent's team bench effectively, you know, not that we're in benches on, on a low league football, but, you know, having to be quite strong when they say, oh, I don't want to swap sides. Well, then find somebody who does because I need you to swap sides. Um, I think that taught me, that was a little bit more challenging because I was a young girl and kind of having to learn to be quite tough at that age was um, quite a challenge. And I think parents, parents could be the worst. That was probably one of the biggest challenges. And that doesn't mean whether I was male or female. I think for referees coming through, that can be quite a difficult place to be. We had a question in advance actually from one of our WIF uh, members and it said, um, this is someone who referees junior girls matches. So just picking up on something you said then, and she asked, do you ever receive negative comments at matches and how does it make you feel? Uh, and I've seen another one on the, on the feed that's about how do you block out that noise from the stands? So I wonder if you might pick up those sort of two points together really about negative comments in the crowd. Yeah, it's, it's a lot worse actually at junior and kind of amateur football level. I think you can hear every single thing everyone says. So, you know, that kind of one man and his dog stood on the sideline. You can hear every word he says. Where if you've got 50,000 shouting at you, I haven't got a clue what they're saying. Um, so I think it's actually more tough at lower levels. Um, and I really do appreciate all the people that are still out there doing, you know, grassroots football um because it's a tough place to be you know when everybody's shouting at you and parents in particular at youth football i think that there's been a lot of work done on that you know and just to hopefully that's a big improvement um but i can't i genuinely can't hear a lot i was at um a premier league ground a few weeks ago and um they came in the security came in at half time and said to me oh we've heard comments of um abuse from behind you in the stands have you got anything to add some um some people have reported it and i said i honestly don't have a clue we have our communication system in so i'm listening for the point the ball's being kicked i'm talking to the referee and the other assistant you know and that you probably don't appreciate how much talking goes on so i hadn't got a clue that any of this abuse is going on you know it's just a roar um so actually kind of that's not a difficult thing really um and so I said to this security guy, I'm I, I, sorry, I can't offer any, any support because I haven't heard anything. Um, and then at the end of the game, he came back and he said, oh, we've removed some people that were abusing you. Um, it's been dealt with. We had another fan report it, uh, which is great to hear that, you know, people are standing up for us officials on the sideline. Um, it's really difficult because I, we just don't hear any of it. I wish that, you know, I could do more about hearing it and, you know, reporting it and things like that but it's just a roar behind you whereas i think at youth football it's a lot more difficult and grassroots football because you like i say you can hear everything you know the amount of times that i can i can definitely more than once or twice that i've gone over to a parent and said there's a whistle you think you can do it that have a go and you, they'll go no 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 you know you just keep doing it and i think that kind of um was kind of my response to it and i i did always try to call it out if I thought that parents were not showing a good example for their children. I think that was, again, like I said about the throwing situation. I think I felt like I was a teacher and I think that, well, went on to be a teacher in my career as well. I think that kind of led into that, that I kind of always was, I tried to challenge it as much as possible because I felt like I was strong enough to do that. Whether uh, at some points so I did kind of think afterwards, my dad came, comes to every game, still does. Um, and he, you know, at some point he just say to me, like, did you not think, what if, you know, what if somebody hit you? And I said, well, they'd only do it once, wouldn't they? And I think, you know, I kind of was never scared of that, really. I kind of always thought that I had to be the strong one that kind of said to the parents on the sideline, no, you've got, you're a role model for these children on the pitch. Stop what you're saying. Excellent. And I mean, it's encouraging to hear that, that people are doing more about it now and calling out uh, the fans as well as um, kind of the officials. And because it sounds like from the chat that there's been a few of our members who've had a maybe a difficult experience. So that's that's positive and encouraging. Great to hear your experience is, is changing. Uh, the person who asked the question in advance to keep up the good work, I'm sure you would say the same to her with her junior girls match refereeing. 
Um, a few of these questions that are coming through now, building on what you're saying, I think, around um, do you have strategies for that resilience and that self-confidence? Because it's coming through a really strong kind of believer in encourage your convictions, stand up for yourself. But has anyone taught you that? Or is that something you've learned along the way? I think refereeing has taught me that, which is uh, a bit strange. I think it, it definitely developed me as a person, you know, as a, as a kind of 13-year-old girl. I wasn't very confident. I had my small group of friends that I went out with. But I wasn't, I, you know, I, I wasn't probably one to stand up to people when they weren't doing the right thing. But that really came through refereeing. It taught me all of those skills. It taught me confidence, resilience, strength, mental strength. And I think now... I've kind of turned that into, yes, I'm a strong character, but I'm very superstitious, is that the right word to say? I do like my routines. I like to be in control of what I can control. So that is built into my kind of psyche, I suppose. It's, you know, like, I like to be at a hotel a certain time before I go to a game the night before. I like to eat the same things. I like to have a bath in the morning at, in my hotel before a game. So we travel to games normally the day before, um, eat in the hotel, um, get up and have breakfast together as a team, all of the officials that are staying together. And then, you know, I'm quite a routine. I play the same playlist on Spotify. I like to have a bath. My head does go a little bit freaky if I haven't got a bath in my hotel room. Um, so I think I very much like I get dressed the same way at the same time. I like to have that routine. I think that's all a little bit, maybe I'm a bit of a control freak. I like to control as much as I can control. So, you know, my, my pre-match during the week will be that I will have known who's going to take corner kicks. I know who, if they're going to play with players on posts. I like to control all, all of the information that I can control. I want to have done that already. So I'm a bit of a stickler for routine, I think. Excellent. Uh, interesting getting into the psychology of your routine and how you approach that. And somebody's asked a question about, you know, the psychological aspects of refereeing. How could a coach uh, help the referee or motivate the referee to have their best game? You know, is there anything that the coaches could do um, or coaches could do um, to make the job a bit easier or, or to help motivate and, and inspire you? Um, I think it's just controlling the players. Like, because some people, some coaches think, oh, well, let's get in the referee's head. They'll give us more decisions. And I hate to think about that negatively. That's all referees think. Oh, they're going to try it on with us. They're going to, you know, um, try and kind of get an advantage over us for their team. And I don't think that really ever worked. I think I was actually nicer when players were nicer to me. So, you know, like I'd always try and, especially when I was refereeing more than running the line now, I'd always try and kind of speak to the captain. If, if they had a good rapport with me, actually it, it might save some of their plays getting booked or something like that. And I think like, you know, it, like I said about sometimes, especially at grassroots football, it can be a very lonely place. And that is sometimes before the game as well. If you're sometimes there for an hour before, kick off or something like that and you know it's just somebody showing you to the changing rooms or you know well, this is the way to the pitch we line up here so routine I think is that can be helpful from a coach or you know secretary or people that are around the players and also just you know like teaching players that we're not the enemy that's quite a nice thing too because I think you know we're there to help the game be played in a fair spirit we want the best team to win um so I think coaching from that perspective rather than what they can get out of a referee is always a nice thing to do. Excellent and and any advice for people who might be listening and thinking actually this has really inspired me I want to go and try refereeing or, or they're already in the grassroots but thinking about progressing any sort of advice for people who are that are already in and want to progress or are thinking about it for the first time? I think if you're thinking about it for the first time go and do it because it teaches you actually so many skills and it gives you this sounds best the best seat in the house because you know it's a front row seat, really. You're involved in it. And, you know, I, th I do generally think it's the best place to be on a football pitch. I could never kick a ball. So that's probably the, be the second best place that I could be on a football pitch. Um, and I think just go for it. I mean, there's lots of places out there. Visit your local county. They can direct you. I think there's um, on the FA.com, there's a, a, a way of getting in touch and getting in touch with refereeing. Um, I think... If you fancy it, give it a go. You know, okay, I can always think that it, I did it for the, for the money, but actually now I love it. I can't imagine my life without it. And so many people say to me, like, when they first start refereeing, actually how much they love it and how much they enjoy it. So 
it's not all the kind of negatives, lawmaker, people shouting at you kind of job. I, I love the job that I do. I get to train all day. You know, I get to spend, okay, a lot of time in hotels, but actually a lot of time then at home when I wouldn't be home as a mom. Um, and, you know, kind of, I love, it doesn't feel like work to me. It feels like something that I really, really enjoy. Um, so I'm thinking if you fancy getting involved, give it a go. And to those already involved, always kind of look to what your next game could be because there's lots of getting promoted in refereeing is a bit like being promoted as a player so you kind of get promoted by the league so you kind of like like I said to do that under 15 local derby game you then kind of go oh now I can do that maybe I'm allowed to referee under 16s games and then you kind of start going through the leagues and um, yeah just I always think to people that want to progress in refereeing just try your best and I think have somebody a mentor that you talk through things and I think that can cross over into lots of different um paths in football have somebody that you really trust that can be critical of your performance whether whether that be a coach a referee a player and because I always had my dad with that like dad comes to every game now so he's he's the most critical person that I have but also my biggest fan so he will tell me if he thinks I've got something wrong you know we're driving home and he'll say oh yeah that throwing in the first half you know what did you think there and I'll be like well I thought I'd seen a nick off the ball or seen it change direction and he'll say oh okay you know so I think it's having those people that you trust around you I think that can be a good key to yeah give it a go and one of the questions that's come in as well is, is uh, partly about more women into refereeing, but particularly women from a BAME background, perhaps, or, you know, others who might be less well represented or be thinking it's not for them. Any thoughts around that and how we can increase diversity amongst uh, referees and officials from BAME communities? Yeah, because like I said, when I first started, I thought it was a typical old white man's job, if it's called a job. Um, and I think it's just... Having, having the courage to have a go. And I think by having more role models out there that we can see that are being encouraged to get into the game um, and, you know, a bit more media coverage over it. And I mean, with the Super League, how much coverage that's got now and the champion, the Women's Championship as well, that they can be places that, you know, you do see more referees from the main backgrounds. And I think it is, um, you know, there's definitely no barriers. I've not felt like... I've had any barriers from refereeing departments in particular that have stopped me progressing in football. And I think that, you know, counties have got their, and I hate to say this, not about a quota for me. It's about access for everybody. So whatever background, race, religion, gender you are, you should be able to be a referee and a coach and a supporter. And, you know, I think that we should encourage people from main backgrounds to get involved in, in football. You touched then on the kind of uh, the women's game as well, and there's a few questions have come in around that. So a uh, question around, do you have observations on the differences officiating men's versus women's football, for example, in reading the play or managing the players, interacting with the team? Uh, and a couple of other questions around, um, you know, kind of people who might have only officiated in women's thinking about the switch to men's. Any, any kind of observations or advice there? Yeah, I mean, the level of women's football is just progressing so fast. Um, you know, when I first started refereeing women's football, the skill level probably wasn't there. I mean, I'm talking, you know, however many years ago, when there wasn't even really any women's teams. I Locally, I didn't know of any to get involved in myself. And as a PE teacher, really, I should have had that information then to hand. And I think now there's so many more grassroots football you can get involved in in women's football. And I think that has generated that big depth of skill. I think now, tactically men's and women's football is pretty much on par they've got so much you know the tactical coaching expertise in women's football is top notch um and i think you know the skill level from women's football is is just increasing by the day um so i think especially in my generation i've seen such a big growth in women's football um that i think there's not a lot of difference now to be honest um and i think you know the good things that we're still missing out on you know Things like there's not so much simulation and, you know, the players kind of, um, you know, a hard tackle goes in and they're straight back up on their feet. And I love that about women's football. And I think, um, you know, there's some things that we really still want to keep. There was another part to that question I think I don't think I've answered. Uh, the part was about, do you read the game differently? Do you do, you do anything differently when you're 
officiating men's and, and women's football is there anything different for you and the other part is for people who've been involved in one but not the other thinking about transferring across yeah so definitely i mean for me the challenge for me was going from i just went through the men's pathway and did a little bit of women's football kind of on the side because there wasn't that much there but now we've got such a strong pathway for women's football coming through that actually you can just go through the women's pathway and go all the way, like I say, like teams do progressing through the leagues. You can do that now just on the women's pathway. So you don't have to go into men's football if you want. But I always liked the men's pathway because it kind of, I seen it as a way to harden me up. That if I could cope with it then, I could definitely cope with it in women's football. Um, because like I say, all of them better routines that you get with women's football. But I don't think I do anything differently when I'm refereeing a Super League game or a Premier League game, our preparation is exactly the same. I'll still analyse the tactics exactly the same, especially now we've got a lot of more access to women's football clips. So, you know, you can watch all the games from the teams that you're likely to play. You know, we have lots of tactical stuff that we have access to. So, you know, you can, you can set it up for just watching corners. Are there people on post? Because I know it sounds really crazy. And from a coaching perspective, people want to know, like, you know, do they... Um, play short at corners, you know, that kind of things. But they probably don't think the referees do things like that. Actually, it impacts on our performance. So if teams play with people on posts for the corners, for example, I know that they're going to be pretty much my last defender. So do they push out quick or not is a big influence on what how I need to prepare for them games. So I think um, across over there, tactical awareness is very similar. I prepare to, to both exactly the same. Yeah. Excellent. And um, any difference in terms of the team report somebody else has asked? Do you, between women's teams and men's teams or boys' teams and girls' teams, do you see any difference then in how the players interact with each other? Uh, it's probably a lot more friendly in women's football. And I think that's probably because I've grown up with a lot of the girls coming through, you know, because, um, you know, I was refereeing England ladies. I remember refereeing England ladies versus um, USA ladies. And... Um, you know, Farrah Williams was playing and people like that, that I've kind of now, when I referee in the Super League, kind of have that rapport that I've been around with them for such a long time. I think everybody's really friendly and, um, yes, professional, still completely professional. Everybody's got a job to do. Um, they're all focused on their own routines and things like that. But I think everybody's got that kind of smile on their face around the changing rooms, you know, do you want a cup of tea? And like I say about that, what we talked about earlier about what can coaches do. And I think in women's football, that's a lot more, open I think you know you can kind of go yeah you sit down and talk with players before and after a game whereas I think with men's football especially at the high level obviously I've been kind of out of grassroots football for a while but I think in men's football they go there they do their job they leave in the cars I think we're we're busting straight to our changing rooms you walk out to the pitch you kind of don't see so many people apart from you know you, you've got your security briefings you've got the police in you know you've got exchange of team troops you've got managers in but you don't really have that time to sit in a boardroom and have a cup of tea so I think that's kind of a bit of a difference between men's and women's football which I hope women's football will keep because it's a really strong <laughs> part of it and another question came in which is about how do you have how many hours prep do you do on the teams before games which is sort of related I suppose to that point you're making about how well you know the teams or the players but uh, but you know kind of what is your prep or how, how you approach that on the team basis yeah, so um, we have access to lots of different tactical, you know, tactical platforms that we can go on to. And actually, people don't think about the hours that we spend analysing tactics. And actually, we do spend quite a lot more time than people think. And that's, you know, that's also bringing up colleagues and saying, you know, like, oh, you had City last week. Um, how did they play? You know, what formation did they play? Um, we like to know starting lineups of teams that were expected to play. We like to, like I say, no players on posts. I want to know if, so um, set pieces kind of free kicks outside the box. Do the defensive line push out quick? Do they drop deeper? They're kind of very important information for my own knowledge. Does the centre forward play on the shoulder? Are they likely to go out on the wings and cross it in? Um, so I'll spend quite a lot of research doing that. That's kind of normally my Wednesday job. Um, you know, kind of train in the morning, then it's prob probably three or four hours. Um, and then I'll probably do another bit on a Friday at a hotel just to kind of recap on and a little bit reading newspapers, what they think the starting lineups are going to be, apps and things that we've got that we kind of look out for. 
um, yeah, quite a lot of tactical tactical knowledge. Yeah. Um, when we spoke the other week, you were telling us about the kind of the way that FIFA and UEFA are preparing you and the sort of homework that you get to prepare for games as well. Maybe say a little bit about that for people so they know what you're doing when you're not, uh, when there aren't live games on for you to be working. Yeah, so at the moment they've upped their level of testing on us. It feels like testing. I think from their point of view it's meant to be training, but it definitely feels like testing. Um, so at the moment on a Tuesday we get sent five clips um, of offside decisions that you have to have. So they are sent at, I think it's eight o'clock UK time, um, and we have to have it back by 11 o'clock UK time. So then five clips you have to sit and watch and give an answer. So it's, and it's not only just the answer, it's the answer. So it's quite easy to say offside or not offside when you can freeze frame a clip. Um, the difficult part comes whether somebody impacts on an opponent. So they can be in an offside position, but whether they actually impact on an opponent and whether their line of vision and them kinds of things. Um, so they're quite some really tricky clips. They send us them on a Tuesday. We're also um, getting sent a set of women's clips that we do weekly. They tend to be on a Thursday and have to be back by Sunday. Um, again, another five clips. Um, we're also doing a perception test at the moment, which is really difficult. Um, it's good for my brain to keep, you know, so it's um, quite hard to describe. I'm trying to think of the easiest way to describe it. Um, you've got the camera effectively as if it was on my head. And I am moving up and down the pitch with the last defender. Um, the defenders push out, the ball is kicked, the attacker crosses over. Um, and you have to say, so you only get it like in normal speed. This is not a slow it down, frame by frame, send the picture on more and more. Um, you get one chance to make a decision. You then have to decide if it's offside or not offside. You then have to choose from five pictures of which picture it was when the ball was kicked. So were the players this far apart, this far apart, this far apart, or this far apart? Um, and that is really, really difficult. So I had one clip the other day where it was um, a short corner was taken. So the attack was on the far side, took a short corner, um, and then the, the, that attacker passed it in. And it was whether there was actually two millimeters extra from one frame to the next, or so whether the player was kind of on or not, which obviously from my angle, I've got two posts, the goal posts between me and him, who's the kicker. Of the, of the corner so it's really hard you could literally see two millimeters extra of him and that was a different picture so yeah it's quite testing but I think they're sending us lots of stuff we've got um we also have to fill in a daily polar file so we're tracked from the Premier League PJ and Wild my bosses they track our polar files to see how fast we're running and we have a GPS tracker that we have to wear for all our training sessions so that is also sent to PJ and Wild and sent to FIFA and UEFA um, and they send us training plans every day. So we're physically training and kind of mentally training. Um, we have a Zoom meeting every Tuesday morning at the moment um, for two or three hours just to keep us kind of updated on all of the laws, um, every, current, current, current things to make sure that we're still keeping our brain ticking, you know, we'll sit and watch clips and things like that as well. So we've kind of got um, actually probably more at the moment than we would do. Um, when the season's in flow because you know they're kind of trying to keep us ticking I think with our actual football. Brilliant uh, you're probably touching on a few things that some of the questions are coming through around VAR um, the laws or offside rule uh, and also some stuff about prep for lockdown I'm not sure we can get through them all without another whole hour but maybe it's a topic for another session but just it sounds a little bit like some of the stuff you're saying there around preparing to return to football is there anything else personally that you're doing obviously it sounds like they're, they're keeping you tested or challenged with the the tasks and also the training but any thoughts in your own mind about your personal preparation for mental or physical for, for that yeah, a little bit tough because it doesn't look like there's going to be any friendly matches so normally in a kind of closed season you'd have that period of rest and then you'd have some friendly matches it's a bit like you know they say it's like riding a bike and it does definitely feel like riding a bike a situation happens and you make a decision and it has to be that kind of instinctive decision that you make and you kind of have to trust that that will still be there but it's going to be really strange without any friendly matches because I think we you know kind of say it feels a bit like you have cobwebs you know um, and like little things like um, I always find that in your first few few matches back that it's you worry a little bit about so we say that staying in line is so vitally important in making our decisions and if 
I'm not in line, even by, you know, one step to the left or right, that can really skew the picture that you see um, for offside. So I think that I'll be training on that definitely. Oh, silly things that you can do at home. So I'll be having my husband out with a video, you know, and I'll be making him create me situations and things like that so that I can still do those things because I don't want to have them cobwebs. I want to be in line and making sure that I am perfectly placed. And especially because sometimes your, your eyes can trick you, I think, in running the line. You tend to, if you look slightly to the left and you watch the ball, your defensive line could have dropped or pushed up by a metre and you're out of position. And it's that kind of like sharpness that you need to be, to have really, which you'd normally get rid of with friendly. So um, that's got to be with, done with the likes of our perception tests and, you know, trying at home to be, you know, keeping up with things and whether that be moving with the dog, when he moves, I move, you know, it's silly things. You know, I'm going to have to kind of like make up that we're without the benefit of having a friendly match really before our next I'm, I'm sure chasing around after a four and a half year old and a dog is going to keep your keep your <laughs> eye over there. And I'm sure there's, you know, everyone on the call has the same confidence in me that you'll be back and, and straight back on your game. Uh, there's a question that's come in around um, pay in uh, for referees generally, but referees in the women's game. Um, and, and sort of, is, is that potentially a barrier or risk? I mean, I think I think you probably started on, was it £25 a, a session as a, as a referee yeah. back in? which probably seemed like a fortune at 13 but uh... yeah I mean it was great I brought my first car I used to save all my football money and buy, bought my first car with it um, and I on a positive note because we don't really tend to spend any night time don't drink and you know we eat quite healthily so you know not really having takeaways and things like that so in some ways we kind of save money in that respect that we're not out all the time um, but I think that it's a big gap still um, you know the, that I'm very fortunate to be in the position that I am, that I get paid to be a full-time athlete. Um, I get paid to train and I get paid for matches um, and that we're on a salary and we're very much protected in that terms. When I first started on the Premier League, we weren't full-time as assistants. Um, that we, you know, I had a full-time job as a teacher. I remember, um, I remember asking my head teacher if I could leave at one o'clock because I needed to get to Sunderland for a, 7 30 kickoff on a night so you know I'd be at school early so she'd always want something back from me you know so I'd be doing an extra trampolining class from seven to eight in the morning before school so that then I could leave at one o'clock I'd get one of my other members of the department to cover me so I'd be buying them chocolate biscuits you know things like that it was always kind of a favor I remember then driving up to Sunderland to do a game a night match getting back in at two o'clock in the morning after the game and starting school starting teaching again the next morning. So I think that's a really tough environment and our girls are still doing that, girls and men, are still doing that on our Super League. And, you know, I'm a big advocate for this needs to change because God forbid we have somebody who is driving back from wherever on a night game because they've been up at stupid o'clock in the morning to do a game. I think it's something that I'm really passionate about that needs to change. Um, we're expecting professionalism from the players and they are professional and we're expecting professional professionalism from referees and they're having to do all this tactical preparation and all of this training along with a full-time job and having to travel to games you know it's difficult you know when you're expecting people to be away from their families because you know we've got somebody on the south coast traveling up to man city for a 12 o'clock kickoff on a sunday they have to travel on a saturday so they're there you have to be at the ground three hours before so, and then you're there with the assessor afterwards. Then you've got the evaluation system, which is what we are evaluated on after, which is video analysis of our performance now. Um, you know, all of that takes time. And I think that we're asking people to go and do that for 60 pounds is too big of an ask for me. Um, I, this doesn't apply to me now because I've got a full-time job. So my match fee doesn't really come into it, but I think it's something that really does need to change. Um, you can only ask so much of them men and women um but it's on the way you know i'm very passionate about it but we're having lots of talks the fa are in lots of talks and the super league i think want the same thing they want professional referees but it all comes down to budget as well doesn't it it's difficult 
Um, it, it sounds like a few people on the chat are uh, kind of supporting some of the things you're saying there about the importance of professionalisation, referees as well as players and, and creating those opportunities and uh, yeah, people who are feeling, I think, that same exhaustion that you might have uh, kind of feel from time to time. But uh, any other thoughts from um, participants on how we tackle that? I think we'd all love to hear them. So we'll open the chat for that. Um, I'm conscious that we're 10 minutes till the end. Um, and what I've been trying to do rather than take questions by one by one is weave them in. So I'm hopeful that we've answered most. As I say, I suspect there's some big questions around VAR, offside rule, etc. that may have to be for another session. Um, uh, but I do want us to look a little bit to the future as well. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, from your perspective, Sean, kind of despite these uncertain times, uh, what are your hopes or dreams, goals for the future? What are you thinking about at the moment? Being short term, it's being back on the pitch. Um, but longer term for me, I feel like I, I'm so passionate about women in football, women in sport, that I really feel like I should be doing more um, you know, I really am a big advocate for um, equality and um, I feel like, you know, sometimes I've got a platform that I don't utilise enough. Um, so for me, I, I kind of want to go into that next, after, after my refereeing career, I am getting a little bit older, not that I like to admit it, um, that I want to kind of go into that. I always joke with my husband, that he says, you know, what do you want to do when you're older? I said, I want to affect change. I want to be able to grow my daughter to grow up in a world where she doesn't see any barriers to being a female. Um, and I think there's still too many there. So I think, uh, what do I want for my future? I want to be able to be in a position where, not power, that's the wrong word to use, to be in a position to affect change. Um, and that's kind of my my life goal in the future. Excellent. Uh, as we were talking about the platform, it, I was thinking about the Megan Rapino quote, it says, you know, it's everybody's responsibility to use whatever platform they have uh, to, to try to do good in the world. And I think it sounds like, um, you know, by being a role model, by working as hard as you are and being, you know, kind of such a great uh, inspiration for so many people, you're definitely doing that. So I think um, I'd certainly encourage you to continue to use that platform and your, and your voice for good. So any kind of, um, you mentioned your daughter there, is there any advice you would give to her or, or your younger self looking back, kind of anything you wish you'd known or you'd like to tell your daughter as she kind of embarks on whatever her future holds? That sometimes life throws a curveball at you. And I think that just trust in yourself, have confidence, be a bit resilient because hard work pays off. And I think that, for me, that's always something that I have abided by. And I'm glad that I have abided by that, that, you know, things don't come easy. I mean, fitness for me does not come easy. To be able to keep up with the players on the pitch, I have to work very hard, you know, um, to be able to keep up with the likes of Sterling, you know, I've got to be able to work hard. I work extra hard on my sprints and my speed. So I think, um, yeah, work hard and good things come to those who work hard. Excellent. Um, well, I mean, it's certainly inspiring me to work a little bit harder. I'm not sure I'll be out for an 8K run later, but you never know. It looks like we're still getting a few final questions in, but I'm conscious that we haven't got a lot of time left. Um, a, qu a quick couple that are media related that are just um, one that's just popped on, which says, do you think referees and assistants should be made available for interviews after the matches? This could be a quick yes, no, or it could be a... a um, <sighs> Sometimes I wish I could say, do you know what? It was my fault. I was a yard ahead of play and I've missed it. You know, part of me thinks, but I don't know whether that would be helpful to anybody, you know? And I, then I think that sometimes we're just going to get the same questions of, you know, you were wrong and you've cost this. And, and I don't think that's helpful, but I think we are doing a lot more media work now than we ever used to be allowed to do. So I think, you know, our, um, on a Monday, we have Dermot who comes out and kind of explains things. And we now have our own media the department that do come out. And I mean, even sometimes they get it wrong. And I think um, coming out and, you know, coming out and saying, yeah, you made a mistake. What, what benefit does that give to a, even anybody listening? I, you know, okay, we can come out and say, yeah, I got it wrong. Deathly silence. Like, what, what more? You know, what more do you want us to say? Kind of when we do get things wrong. Um, so I kind of, I, I do and don't. If that makes sense, because sometimes I do want to come out and say, oh, "I'm sorry, everybody, I got it wrong." And I know that's cost this team this. Um, but at the same time, I do think we'd be saying the same thing every week because we. It's always going to be about our mistakes that we've made. So, 
Mm. The final related one on media, so this is a question I think popped up before and I was hoping to get a chance to bring it in, but you know, think about maybe stuff that's in the media that's maybe negative or critical. Um, do you read that or do you ignore it, that social media and press reports? What's your strategy? Um, I don't tend to because I'm a very big believer in trusting my own decisions. And actually we get analysed so much that it can be negative mentally. So, you know, if I've, especially with VAR now, we know when we've made a mistake. So, you know, I was at a game the other week, flagged offside, it wasn't offside, got overturned. So you've got to go through the rest of that game knowing that everybody knows you've made a mistake. So, you know, we know when we've made mistakes and because of our evaluation system after the and I think people don't think that referees hate getting things wrong hate it it's like when I'm driving home from a game and actually I quite like VAR in that respect because when I'm leaving the ground I haven't changed the outcome of that game now so you know when I made that mistake the other day the other week um and I, you know I was going to rule a goal off that should have been given that mistake got overturned there and then I wasn't leaving the ground thinking you know, oh my God, that result should have been a completely different result because that is the worst feeling in the world. So I think that in that terms, there's no point in reading media, you know, if, if you know, that this referee was awful today or this referee was awful today because we have our evaluation system, our coaches, um, you know, it's Dr. Park with VAR now, they can listen in to what we're saying. So don't, we not only analyse decisions, we analyse how we got to that decision. So, you know, like, so a lot of it is, yes, what we see, but also what we feel or what we, you have to, sometimes you have to put two and two together in football. Well, the ball went in this direction, so it must have come off this person. So a lot of it is kind of like, not guesswork, that's the wrong thing to say. It's about using our experience to get the right decision um, and knowing that normally if this and this happens, this has happened to cause it, you know, that kind of thing. And I think that when we have our evaluation come through then normally on a Monday, Tuesday, you've got every single decision that you've made in a game. So minute by minute, and then you've got like a color coded system. So I'm like, you open it and you go, <sighs> green, 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 red. And like, and you think to yourself, right, okay. And you open the clip and you think, right, I've got that wrong. Why have I got that wrong? Was it my positioning? Was it that I was looking at the wrong thing? That kind of thing. So I think that, that kind of gives me all the evaluation I need, really. So I don't think I need it from the media. I think it's brilliant that you're, you're always learning by the sounds of things. So I think the attitude's great. And again, think of the, another quote which popped in my mind, Nelson Mandela, and he said, I never lose, either win or learn. And it sounds to me like that's absolutely the attitude that you're taking, Sean. It's been so inspiring to hear from you today. And I, I can see on the chat as well, a lot of people who really appreciate how open you've been, how um, thoughtful and, and who will really just wish you all the best kind of as you return to, um, kind of return to officiating refereeing and, and yeah, just a huge thank you from me. And I'm sure on behalf of everyone else for a fascinating hour. I could, I could do it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Over to you, Jane. Yeah, listen, amazing. Um, thank you both. That was absorbing. It was fascinating. A real insight into the game from a woman at the top of her game. Um, for myself, I like to sometimes think about some of the things people say that are applicable in all our lives and in all our jobs. And I wrote down some, some notes I learned from that, Sean. Uh, you know, the importance of others having belief in you and having that kind of private boardroom around you, cheering you on. Uh, everything you said about confidence, resilience and mental strength, and it doesn't come from nowhere. We all need to work on that. Um, mentors, the importance of, of mentors, the importance of increasing, increasing diversity. Um, hard work pays off. I completely agree with that. Um, and finally, if you, uh, the, your thoughts about if you, I've got, a, sometimes I worry, I've got a platform and I don't utilise it enough. Well, I think you've utilised it brilliantly today. Thank you. One thing I didn't say in, in my intro is, of course, you are an ambassador for women in football and we are super grateful for that. Um, so a million thanks again. Thank you, Ruth, for facilitating and chairing that so fantastically. And, and thanks to everybody on the call for your engagement. The chat has been really busy. The questions have been great. Um, do let us know on Twitter or on email, and it's info at womeninfootball.co.uk. 
your thoughts on this webinar. We'd love to hear from you because we will be running more of these. We've got a programme of these to unroll. Um, so look out for that email in your inbox soon, but it is important you let us know what you want because that really helps us shape the online offer that we're developing. So Sean, Ruth, Cassie, everybody, we've got to sign off now, but, but thank you again for an absolutely fantastic hour. And Sean, good luck with your 8K today. <laughs> All the best, everybody. Bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>